Hello everyone and welcome to today's lecture. Um, today we're going to be talking about uh, static analysis techniques and we learned a little bit about static analysis last class when we talked about security testing and security um, in addition to sort of the two types of security testing that we looked at namely uh, pen testing and fuzzing we also talked about how static analysis can also be uh, something that can be useful uh, when it comes to locating, uh, finding, and then fixing um, security bugs. So today we're going to step back and look more broadly at how static analysis fits into the software quality assurance uh, toolbox uh, that we have as developers. And um, I want to discuss a little bit about how static analysis differs from dynamic analysis, uh, which includes techniques like testing. Uh, and we're going to look at a number of different specific static analysis techniques that you can do. And uh, namely, we're going to look at what's called control flow analysis, data use analysis, interface analysis, information flow analysis, and path analysis. And then we're going to look at three specific uh, tools that uh, employ some or all of these types of analysis techniques in order to help with the identification of uh, software bugs. Um, lastly, we're going to look at a case study of how static analysis tools have been used in the past at uh, NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab uh, by discussing a tool that they've used called Scrub that they've developed in-house. Um, so that's sort of the plan for today. Um, and yeah, so let's get into it. As usual, please let me know if you have any questions as we're going along, okay? So when we talk about static analysis and dynamic analysis, it's important that we have an understanding of how these different techniques um, relate and how they're different. Namely, uh, dynamic analysis is what we spent a lot of the course talking about, and it's any type of a software analysis uh, that involves executing the program, observing outcomes of that execution. So things like software testing are a great example of dynamic analysis because the way it is we take our inputs our test cases and we run them and we want to observe the outputs uh, of those inputs and sometimes what we want to do as well as we with white box testing we saw how we use code injection to instrument the program to observe even more outputs um, such as the which lines of code get executed and so on so that's what dynamic analysis is it's analysis of the software with Involve, or sorry, involving execution. Uh, static analysis, on the other hand, involves examining the program without executing it. So that means it involves uh, an analysis of the source code or analysis of uh, some other attributes that don't require you to execute and run the code. So an example of static analysis is something like code inspection where we actually or a code walkthrough where we read through the code to try to understand um, how it works. Now um, static analyzers or automated static analyzers are a particular class of tools that allow you to automate static analysis. So they, they automatically do the static analysis for you. Um, when I mentioned about the idea of walking through code or code inspections um, this is what the technique where you actually by hand read through the source code and look for problems. Um, static analyzers, on the other hand, are tools that you can use during inspection activities or just general quality assurance activities uh, to help identify problems automatically. Um, and uh, in general, you'll find that a lot of static analyzers work really well with languages that lack strict type rules, such as C. Uh, whereas languages such as Java um, th the reason that static analyzers, it's not that they don't work with those, but they maybe aren't as useful because a language like Java um, that has strict typing, it actually, um, the language features that often static analyzers can help identify, those aren't available in that type of a language. So, uh, for example, all variables must be initialized in a Java program. Therefore, if you've got all variables being initialized then before use, then uh, you're not going to run into errors where people try to use them without a proper definition. So 
this is just an example of sort of about static anal analysis and static analyzers, which are these automated tools for doing this. So, um, how does a basic static analyzer work? And how, before I even ask that, have any of you, do you know of an example of a tool that's a static, does static analysis or a static analyzer? Have you learned about any of these tools in your classes? Because they can be used for more than just software quality assurance. Um, so someone mentioned a tool here. Do you want to tell us why it's a static analysis tool? So the suggestion here, or the tool that was mentioned, was uh, IntelliSense, and it the comment was that it checks that the, and this I believe is a Visual Studio Code plugin, correct? Um, so it actually goes through and does uh, uh, code completion, content assist, code hinting. So it does an analysis of the code. So yeah, I guess that that could be a reasonable type. That could be considered some of these aspects. Uh, because it is actually analyzing the code as you write it. Um, although in those sense, it's not a traditional static analyzer often, because sometimes it, uh, some of the, the some of what it does might actually be used more. Um, uh, it can actually use um, potentially machine learning or other things as well. Uh, but it's a, it's a, it's an interesting uh, one. So yeah, I, I guess I, I honestly don't know enough about how it works underneath to decide, to be able to comment. Um, but uh, I do know I think IntelliSense does include something called it does have a code linter as well, which is something we're going to talk about lint as a tool. Um, so that is definitely static analysis. Uh, any other tools you know of that are you consider static analysis tools? Has anyone taken a course in compilers? Not yet? Okay. Um, so when you get to a compiler course, um, you're going to find that uh, during compilation, there's a lot of analysis that's done of the source code um, as part of the compilation process. And that often involves doing analysis of the code before you compile and execute it. And that type of analysis is also a, often a type of static analysis as well. Um, so it can be useful as part of compilation. So I just want to mention that static analysis isn't always about quality. Um, it can have different purposes as well. So just want to put that out there. Um, so how do these static analysis tools work? Well, all of them basically have three uh, standard steps or basic steps. So a static analyzer, the very first thing a static analyzer will do is it actually will read or scan the source code. And what it does when it's scanning the source code is it's actually doing, essentially, um, it's actually uh, inputting the source code into the tool and storing it usually in some sort of format, right? Or anal or um, or scanning the source code and recording certain key pieces of information. Um, the next thing it does is it actually performs an automated analysis of the code. So for example, if it reads in the source code, it might do uh, an analysis to verify that maybe it's going to check that, you know, um, all buffers are protected against buffer overflows. We, we, read, we learned about that in our security testing lecture. Or maybe it's going to check to make sure that um, all variables are defined before use. That kind of thing. Um, or maybe it's going to analyze uh, more complex information about the flow of data or analyze to see that all statements in the program can be executed or or we call reachable. Um, so it does some sort of automated analysis depending on the goal or the purpose. And then what it'll do is it reports any anomalies or faults. So not everything that a static analyzer lists is a fault. Some of it is anomalies, warnings, uh, information that 
it detects which may be useful in understanding a problem or uh, something about the system that you uh, could Im could end up improving it or could give, give you insight into it. So that's sort of the three basic steps. You scan the source code, you perform an automated analysis, and then report any faults, anomalies, or patterns uh, of interest. And then in terms of what type of analysis these tools are actually performing, that can actually vary. In our case, we're really interested in on static analysis tools that check for different types of faults. So when we're looking at different types of faults, um, there are different kinds of things we might want to look for. So for example, if we're looking at faults that are related to data, in other words, data faults, some of the types of checks we may want to do is just like what I mentioned before. Make sure that a variable uh, isn't used before initialization. Uh, check to see if a variable is declared but never used. Check to see that variables um, are never assigned twice, um, or you or check, I guess, if they're assigned twice, they are used between the assignments. Uh, check for array out of bounds violations or possible violations, and check for undeclared variables. Uh, and then, in addition to data faults, you may also want to do what's called control faults, which are really dealing with the control flow that we talked about when we were doing white box testing about the different paths through the source code. And with control faults, we're looking for things like unreachable code, right? Code that's in the program that you can never get to. For example, um, if you had a line that just said, if not true, you're never going to reach the code after it. Or if you had code after a return that where the return is always true happens, this kind of thing. Um, so that's one example of control faults. Another one is unconditional branches into, into loops is another one that you sometimes will look for as well. Um, and then you can also have another group of faults that you might be interested in that you can check for a static analysis are what are called input and output faults. And these are ones where variables get output twice with, for example, no inter intervening assignment, right? So you should only be outputting new information, right? So if you see these odd patterns where uh, things are happening either like in its input twice but you never actually process it or it's output twice and never actually gets processed um, that kind of thing that's something that's obviously not an intention of the program because it doesn't really make much sense why you do it um, so those are examples of things you can check with input output faults okay um, and then interface faults is another thing so interfaces we're talking about if you think about um, interfaces in a in a class in a program, an object-oriented program, you might have an interface. Uh, things like parameter type mismatches, parameter number mismatches, uh, non-use of results of functions. So you know cases where you're calling functions that return something, and you don't actually take the value. The value just doesn't get used ever. Doesn't get stored even. Uh, as well as on-called functions and procedures that exist in an interface but are never used anywhere in the program. Uh, and then the last category that I'll mention is what I call storage management faults. And these are uh, really a lot of the things you see these for, and especially in a language like C++ or C, is, with, is you're talking about memory management and you're talking about pointers. So things like unassigned, unassigned pointers, uh, pointer arithmetic that's used that may be incorrect, that kind of thing. Um, so that's the kind of faults you might want to be able to, or that you can check with static analysis. And depending on the type of fault, you're going to actually use a different type of analysis. So in the case of data faults, or even sometimes input-output faults and storage management faults, you're going to use what's called data use analysis. That's where you're going to identify variables, um, and their uses um, and look for things such as the variables not being initialized, declared, and so on. Hmm. Excuse me. For control flow faults, or for, for control faults, you're going to look at control flow analysis, which is what we actually did by hand when we looked at path coverage. And control flow analysis will help you to identify clearly which code is potentially unreachable, as well as things like uh, identify information about loops, exit and entry points into a function, that kind of thing. Um, to find interface faults, you're going to do something called interface analysis, where you're going to check 
uh, for consistency of declarations, use of procedures, and so on and so forth. And this can be really useful as well um, when you're ever dealing with interfaces to identify potential problems with how you're utilizing an interface. Um, then you're also going to have uh, other types of analysis like information flow analysis, which can also help with input-output dependencies. Um, they're not necessarily faults, though, but they can help you identify variable dependencies and so on. Um, but they can warn you about how you're using them. And lastly, you're going to have path analysis, which can identify all paths through a control flow graph. So one thing you might want to do with a path analysis is uh, it might be the case that, let's say you've got some software for credit cards. Uh, you might want to verify uh, before you, uh, you might want to check to make sure there's no path through the software where you ship a package before you verify that a credit card is valid or before you charge a credit card. So that's the kind of thing where you, if there's a function for charging a credit card, there's a function for shipping a package, you can verify there's no path through there where the function for ship gets called before the function for charge or charge payment. So that's just like one example of something in a path analysis that would be useful. So that can help you to verify properties about how the software is supposed to work and potential issues in how you've coded it. Um, any questions about these types of analysis before I move on to some examples? Okay. So the first thing I want to do is I want to now talk about some actual tools that are useful. And I'd really recommend you can actually use these tools yourself on, uh, on your own software. You can actually use them to analyze the projects you're doing in this course. And one of those is a tool called Lint, which is a static analyzer. And Lint's been around for a long time. And um, I think the initial version of Lint was for C. And uh, it actually was run on uh, Linux systems. And you can find some more information. But there are also some new variations of Lint, such as JLint is also available, which um, is a tool for Java, uh, a Lint for Java. So let's look at a little example here. Um, here's a piece of code. This code compiles. Actually, it compiles and has no errors. This is a C file. So, is this code correct? It compiles, but is it correct? Is there any problems you see in it? Okay, there's a mention here that print array only has one parameter, yet it's getting called in the main with three parameters. Um, yep, that's true. Anything else? Is that it? Okay, so someone just said they can't see anything else at the moment. Uh, someone said brackets, question mark. Well, the brackets would usually get caught uh, by, uh, if there are brackets, that would get caught by a compiler. Um, uh, there are curly brackets around the printf there because that's the body of the function. Um, I see someone else said not setting I and C. So I and C are passed without being initialized, I think is what was mentioned here. Uh, and the bad fi signature function where the print array that gets called with three parameters when the definition is one. Okay. So. Well, what about if we ran 
this on a static analyzer? Could it tell us something that we can't pick up on our own? Well, this is sort of the purpose of what these tools are for. So if we run the standard lint on this code, what kind of messages and warnings might it give us? Well, let's see. Um, here is the messages from lint. And, uh, oops, I gotta move this way. There, that way you can see it a little better. So if you look at this now, I've run lint on this same piece of code. The first thing it tells me is there's a warning on line 10. C and I might be used before being set. That's the line here with, if you see, uh, that's the line with the I, the print array, an array, I, C here. Um, I and C are passed into this function, but um, they are never initialized here. They're not given an initial value on line number nine. So that's an issue. Uh, there's also a comment here, uh, print array, va variable number of arcs on line 10. So this is getting to the point that this print array has three arguments versus the one up here. And then it also says, print array argument one used inconsistently on lines 10 and 11. Okay, so this is where it's again, it's getting into the arguments here again. And then the last one is printf returns a value which is always ignored. So it turns out the printf, it returns a function. The function returns a value. Do you know what printf returns? What does printf return? Nope, it doesn't return nothing. It returns something. An int? Yep, that's right. What's the value of the int? It doesn't return a true false saying it's printed or not. What is what does it return? Not an int. Okay, negative one if you fail. What is it? If it's a positive number, what does it represent? You can look it up if you want. Yep, there's the answer. The number of characters printed. So it'll tell you how much information was printed by this printf statement, the number of characters. So uh, this will actually, that's what's returned. But in this case here, printf, we're not actually saving that value that's returned the number of integers, we're just discarding it. So that may be on purpose, that may not, but it's giving us a warning here that we're not actually doing anything with that return value. So this is useful information. So the point here is, is that this little piece of code, while it compiles and is correct from that perspective, could have a number of issues, which will mean it will not run properly or will not run as expected. Uh, when you uh, when you actually go about executing it. So this is an example of one static analysis tool called Lint. It did all this analysis and identified these potential issues, not by running the code, but by just scanning the code, analyzing it, and producing warnings. Any questions? You can try running this on the code for your project if you're interested, the lint tool. Now, another static analysis tool is called Spot Bugs, and it's um, one that it's on, it's built on top of one that I used to use quite a bit called Find Bugs, but it's a successor of Find Bugs, so it's an open source tool, and you can find out about it by, if you go to spotbugs.github.io. And again, this one can be downloaded. It an, this one analyzes Java byte code. And what it does is it looks for patterns. So it analyzes, it scans the bytecode, analyzes it to see if in the bytecode there are patterns that are called, or that are basically there are patterns in the code that are the same as known bug patterns. So SpotBugs has a whole, um, I don't know if you call it a dictionary, but a whole list of uh, possible bug patterns and types of bugs they can lead to. And then what it does is it goes through the code to see if there are any instances of those patterns in your code. And if there are, it lets you know, hey, 
code that looks like this or uses this pattern often has this problem. And now, the thing to remember is with static analysis, you can actually have what are called false positives. So because you're analyzing it, you're not necessarily running the code, it can sometimes tell you, hey, this could be a problem when it's not. So um, in the case of a tool like SpotBugs or even in Lint, it can tell you or give you warnings which you can discard, which aren't necessarily uh, really bad things. They're just warnings that could be bad things. So uh, when SpotBugs does its analysis, it uses a whole bunch of existing bug patterns um, from a variety of different categories. And you can see the full list here. There's a link to it in the slides. But they're classified into a number of different categories. So they have patterns that they call bad practices, correctness, internationalization, malicious code vulnerabilities, um, multi-threaded correctness, performance, security, and one category that's just called dodgy. Um, and each of these categories has a whole bunch of patterns that are related to uh, that category. So, um, so you, depending on, and you can run your code against all of the categories of patterns, or if you're focused and interested in a specific thing, you can actually pick a specific category of patterns or even a specific pattern if you want. So if you, for example, are writing multi-threaded um, code in Java where you're using threads and the java.util.concurrent library, you could actually enable the multi-threaded correctness warnings and not turn on the other ones and just focus on the warnings for those. Reasons you might want to reduce and look at some warnings and not others is partially because there is a time associated with doing the analysis, right? So the analysis, even if it's quick, you have to go through all the warnings and assess whether or not the warnings are real problems or just look like problems but weren't real. So you have to figure out if they're false positives or not. And some categories may lead to higher rates of false positives than others, depending on the software. And if you've got a limited amount of time to do the analysis on these, rather than be overwhelmed by a lot of bug, bug warnings that you need to actually then go and assess, you may decide to focus on the most critical or high risk bugs and get analysis results on those if you don't have the full time to do a, a comprehensive review of all the warnings from all of the patterns. Okay? So if we want to go into one of these categories and see, well, what exactly does a pattern look like? Let's go take a look here at a couple of these. Let's look at a couple of example bug patterns. Um, this is the first one here is called is a bad practice pattern. That's the first category. And it tells us that the method may fail to close a stream. Right? That's, for example, an input or an output file stream would be an example. So there is a stream that doesn't look like uh, it was closed. And if this happens, this could actually be an indicator that there's a file descriptor leak. So it may be something that you want to avoid. Um, now, uh, in some cases, it might be that you actually close the file in some other part of the code and it, the analysis didn't actually detect that you're doing it somewhere else. Uh, but it may be the case that you actually did unintentionally forget to close it and you want to know this information. Um, another uh, pattern, and this falls under the category of dodgy patterns, and this is that there is a redundant null check of a value known to be non-null. Okay, So this is basically unnecessarily, this is an unnecessary check. So this is something that is not going to lead to incorrect behavior, but is making your software slightly less efficient. It's, it's something that you don't need to do, right? If you're checking uh, that a value, if you're checking a value to see if it's null and it's known to be a non-null, it is non-null, then uh, why would you do it, right? It's an extra check you don't need. So you can make your program slightly more efficient by just removing that check. So these are two examples of bug patterns uh, that you can find in the uh, in this tool, in the spot bugs tool. Okay, so spot bugs, you can actually, oh, up here, you can actually download it there and try running this on your code. Okay, so the last tool I want to mention is, is actually not an open source tool, 
uh, but is actually a commercial tool from a company called Gramatech. And this is something called Code Surfer Path Inspector. And I, um, this is actually quite a cool tool. I, I quite like this a bit, uh, or I like it quite a bit, I should say. Um, and what this does is it actually analyzes C programs for sequencing properties. And that example I gave you earlier, um, such as you want to verify that your software always charges a credit card before shipping a product, that's the kind of thing you can verify or you can check with Code Surfer Path Inspector because it can do things like check to see if a call to a function X does make sure like or here's another example you may want to always um, validate the user's credentials or something so you could actually say check here to see that the validation of credentials always happens or that statement Y occurs only after a statement Z right function call y occurs only after function call z. Um, and path inspector will determine if the se sequencing property is true or false. If it's false, then it produces a counterexample, which is a trace of through the program that shows you an execution path that the property cannot be true. Now the one thing I will mention about this is is that it does the analysis statically. Okay, so you think about doing this analysis through a path analysis through a control flow graph, for example. And one of the challenges with that is it's not actually executing them. So it's possible that in the, in the uh, control flow graph, there are paths through the code that appear but are infeasible. So you, there's never a way you can go through this if statement and this if statement where both of them are true, right? And that's but it looks like it when you look at the graph it looks like you could but in reality you can't um, so there are these kinds of cases can occur so there can be again just like other static analysis tools you can have uh, false positives uh, in this case and, and false negatives so you can actually end up in situations where it gives you results based on perceived paths and not actual paths that are possible um, so I just want to mention that any questions on those tools? So that's three static analysis tools that we looked at. We looked at Lint, we looked at Spotbugs, formerly Findbugs, and we looked at Gramatex uh, Path Inspector, Code Surfer Path Inspector tool. So the last part of the lecture I wanted to devote uh, to looking at a case study of how <coughs> NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab uh, uses static analysis and now this isn't this is an interesting example and to be honest I don't know if they still utilize this tool uh, but I wanted to include it because I think it's it's a really good insight into it and it's not always easy to get insight into how different companies use different tools so um, even though this is actually a little bit of an older example <clears throat> I've kept it in the lecture material primarily because it is a nice case study and does actually uh, help to demonstrate sort of how these tools have been used um, in practice. So um, this person here is uh, Gerard Holzman, uh, formerly of NASA JPL, and when he was at NASA JPL, uh, one of the things that he actually looked at was how do we actually better incorporate uh, formal methods and static analysis tools into software development uh, within NASA. And he gave um, a keynote there at a conference I was at about 13 years ago. And he was talking about um, a tool called Scrub and Spin at the time. And he, this tool, what it did was it collected all of the mechanically produced error reports, as well as, remember I told you about code inspection, code review? <coughs> also any reports from manual code reviews. Uh, and by clicking on a number and it generated input and it got collected all of the input into a uniform interface so um, so that when you're doing a code review uh, the developer gets not only the manual comments from the code reviewer but they also get all of the other information and warnings from static analysis tools like the ones we just talked about um, and this tool Scrub is a source code review user browser. Um, and in addition to the static analysis tools, it also used formal analysis tools. And uh, these are tools which used formal mathematical modeling. 
Um, and some of the tools it used were things such as Coverity, which is a testing tool, GCC, Uno, and CodeSonar. And these are all tools you can look up individually. Uh, they're not super important to know the exact details of them right now. Um, the important thing to understand is, is that what they're doing is they're using actually a combination of many different tools here. And what the tool interface, and this was the version that we saw, looked something like this. And uh, basically what you're seeing here, and if you can see my screen, or can you see my mouse on the screen? I believe you should be able to. Um, Yep, great. So what you're seeing here basically is this. Um, you're seeing, in this tool, you're seeing the actual source code, okay? And this is the source code right here in the light yellow. And it's telling you information about the release, the module you're looking at, as well as the line number. You can go and search if you need to. And then down here, you can look at the files, the comments that have been written about this file, and so on. And then you can click on and off the different analysis that you want to see in your summary. So uh, there's stats here, which could be some basic metrics about the software, things like complexity, number of lines, average number of lines per method, longest method, that kind of stuff. GCC, uh, which is a compiler, and GCC strict, which gives you information that these compile tools produce. Coverity, code sonar, you, uh, Uno and uh, MSL, MISL, which is I think now uh, CIL. Or is MSL, I think that's what that stands for. I'll have to double check to be honest, I'm not sure. Um, so each of these analysis tools can perform analysis on your code. And um, what the tool does is it actually um, goes about running these types of analysis and giving you the feedback. And what it does is it gives you the feedback and then uh, the um, person who's writing the code, the developer, they have to look at these this feedback and they have to decide how to handle it. So um, this is the keynote here. I've, I can't show this during this slot, this lecture due to copyright, uh, but it is available here. And what I'd recommend to do is to watch uh, from minute 30 to minute 42. So let me just pause for a second here. So we're back and uh, we've just watched uh, part of this video on the use of this scrub tool um, at NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab. As I mentioned, this is from a little while back, but I think it's still interesting to hear some of the comments about how they were using it. A couple things I'll note which I think are uh, interesting uh, from this. One of them is, is that this tool combines the user feedback from, from code reviews with the with the automated feedback from static analyzers and, and other tools. Um, and these static analyzers and other tools, they actually are running and analyzing the code uh, during the off hours, so in the night, for example, when developers are not there. So they're, they're actually taking advantage of sort of those uh, down hours to actually do this analysis. So the analysis is, uh, even though it, of course, costs computational time in that, it's not actually impacting the speed that the systems are running at when developers are active. Um, one thing that I think is is useful, and I've pulled out one uh, diagram from the presentation that I wanted to point to you, point you to, and that is uh, the comparison of how developers rate issues or items that were peer comments versus tool reports. So as you can see, this is sort of the choices that they have um, to give. So they can either, whenever they read a particular comment or issue from a tool or from a, a user, um, they can either say they agree with it, they want to discuss it, they disagree with it, they could say override, or they can say, or they can just do a no response. And um, so in general, the disagree is interesting because disagree they often disagree with a peer comment or tool report fairly consistently, right? In terms of the percentage time. However, when it comes to peer review, peer comments, there's a m much higher number of developers agree with the peers' comments 
um, than with a tool comment and there's a lot of no responses on tool comments. So what does that tell you, do you think? Is that just simply a product of there's a face or there's a person to associate with a peer comment versus a tool that can be ignored? They're basically agreeing with 10% of the tool comments, disagreeing with 15% of them, and not responding to over 70% of them. I can understand why the discuss is really low, because who are you going to discuss the tool report with? Um, so I see one comment here, someone said the peer comments might be more insightful. Um, yeah, um, a false positive. So I think those are the two points there. Um, I think that it's most likely that in general, because remember the people who are doing peer review of or, co or code review of this code are often other developers. They have the insight and knowledge and expertise that the developers have to understand the NASA ecosystem, to understand how software is written at NASA, and understand the subtleties about uh, how to what can cause issues and what can't. Uh, whereas the uh, a lot of the tools are general purpose tools that don't necessarily have the insight about the organization. Uh, and my guess is that the high no response is actually a result that of one of two things, either a lot of false positives or quite simply a lot of reports. Like if you're getting 100 reports or 200 reports from the tools and you're getting five each day from code reviewers, you're going to be, you know, you, it's, it's, it's easier to drown out the, the tool reports a bit as noise. So it's either that there's a lot of them are false positives or there's just too many of them and people start ignoring them. It, it's one of those two things I have, I, I imagine. So anyway, but I think it's interesting to compare and I like this, uh, this presentation a lot because it talks about the idea of manual feedback from others in your team versus automated feedback and how how developers often respond to it. Um, so that's what I liked about this. So I'm hoping that you took that insight and didn't just say, oh, well, this is actually, uh, you know, from uh, 12, 13 years ago, so it's not useful anymore. That's, you know, I hope you took the right insight from it. Um, and just to, so you just to remind you, in terms of this graph here, this was actually the results based on one year of using Scrub with about uh, just under a quarter of a million lines of code. So just want to point that out. Okay, so in summary, um, we finished off our lecture on static analysis and automated static analyzers. Um, the thing that I want you to take away from this is that automatic static analyzers can be complementary to testing and dynamic analysis and they can also be complementary to manual code reviews and code inspections um, and that there are a number of different analyzers they all have the same sort of basic three steps we talked about right scanning the code analyzing in some capacity and then producing um, anomalies, errors, or, or warnings. Uh, but there are actually a number of different types of analysis that can actually be useful in, in providing different kinds of warnings and, provide, and finding different kinds of faults. Um, if you want to read more about this uh, scrub tool that I mentioned, I do have a link in the slides and I'd encourage you to uh, take a look at it if you want. Um, to learn more about it, or you can even watch the rest of the video in your own time. Um, so that concludes today's lecture on uh, using static analysis tools and thank you very much.